continuing on in the series in 1 Thessalonians. Um, we just started that book, and you see we're going to look at verses 4 through 10 today. Um, I call it examples and imitators. There's two sides kind of of the, of the same coin there. If you are an example, you have somebody imitating you. If you are imitating somebody, then there is an example there for you. Okay, but first, I got a couple, I think, humorous stories. They are stories that parents with small children have sent in, um, but it, it really is integral to the message as well. I know, sometimes my jokes have nothing to do with the message. They were just funny, you know, but uh, um, these really do have to do with our, our message today. So kids imitating their parents. One mother sent in. No, the dad sent this in. There was a time when my son was at an early years drop-in center and was driving a play car and shouted, Get out of my way, idiot! At some other children. <laughs> Where could he have picked that up from, the dad says. Huh? Yeah. All right, here's another one. I put my son in the car when he was about two and a half to three years old. It was raining, and suddenly out of nowhere, he started saying, frickin' rain, frickin' rain, frickin' rain, over and over. I was so, so alarmed, I just laughed. Where did that kid pick that up from? Well, I wonder, huh? After I apparently said it one time too often, and my daughter did not want to do the activity, I can't remember exactly what it was, she turned to me and says, that is not appropriate for children, and I'm not doing it. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Probably the mom had said that to the little girl, that is not appropriate, you know, and she picked that right up. I like this last one here. Sometimes my son, age two, he's two years old, will put himself in time out. Makes my job a lot easier, the mother said. I can hear him say to himself, no throwing toys. One, two, three, time out. Then he will go and sit in the time out chair. <laughs> well, yeah, children learn from our parents' examples. huh? And that's, we're going to look at that today in our text. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we covered last week, um, verses 1, 2, and 3, the introduction and Paul's greeting, and then Paul prayed for them, remembering their work of faith, their labor of love, and their steadfastness of hope. Remember those three things last week. Well, we're going to pick up with verse 4 uh, this week, and we're going to talk about verses 4 through 10. For we know, brothers, loved of God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with the full conviction. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became, there's the important word, imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction and the joy of the Holy Spirit. So that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, Paul says, so that you, we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Then the last verse. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivered us, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Verse 10, the last verse of the chapter, again referring to the end times and Jesus' second coming, and that's going to be in every chapter as we go through this book. I hope you picked up an outline. I had an outline, and I know it wasn't my, my cardboard. I've been just leaving the paper in there, my cardstock. But here's my outline uh, for this week. Um, being imitate, pretty simple outline. Being imitators, verses four through six, 
Secondly, becoming an example. So first they were imitators, then they became an example, verses 7 and 8. And, well, then an explanation. What did they exemplify to others who looked to them as being an example? So being imitators, becoming an example, and what they exemplify. All right, let's jump into this. Point number one, being imitators, verses 4 through 6. Uh, for we know, brothers beloved of God, that he has chosen you. By, by the way, I go back to verse 4. He has chosen you, and we could get into the whole doctrine of election and things of that nature here. But, but you, you remember that we talked about the Roman road system, and Thessalonica was on a major trading route in the Roman Empire. God called Paul by the Macedonian call over. He went to Philippi, and then he came to Thessalonica, and got a church established there, and God wanted a church especially established there because it was on a major trade route for the Roman Empire, and the gospel was able to spread much from that. So God certainly wanted a church located in Thessalonica. Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the spirit, and with full conviction, Paul preached, the Holy Spirit took God's word, convicted these people, and they came and accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Paul says, you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. Paul set an example. We came in, you know what kind of people we were. Verse 6, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Okay, imitators. Paul came in there. Uh, the Thessalonians heard the gospel. They accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. And this, remember, they were, there were some Jews there that had some Old Testament background, but most of them were Gentiles. The gospel comes for the very first time. They hear the gospel. They accept the Lord. And now what? What's this Christian life all about? We don't know. We don't know what to do. We don't know what it is. We don't know how, you know, they had the Holy Spirit. They had the Word of God. But they had the example of the Apostle Paul and Timothy and Silas so that they could know what the Christian life was like. I say here, uh, the Greek word, it's interesting for imitator, it is the Greek word mimites. We got mimic from that. We got our word mime from that. We even get our word, English word imitate from that. Uh, there's a couple of cross-references. Uh, the meaning of it was imitator. So <laughs> I didn't go into a long uh, <laughs> thesaurus, or not thesaurus, but a lexicon um, definition of it because the lexicon definition of it was to be an imitator, to copy something, somebody. But I got a couple of important first um, cross-references here for it. 1 Corinthians 4.16 says this, I urge you then, be imitators of me. So Paul said that the Thessalonians used him as an example, and Paul says, well, they, they look at me and they see the Christian life. And so when Paul wrote Cor the Corinthians, he thought, well, how do they know the Christian life? Copy my life, he says. I come in, I'm a, a, a godly man. You see honesty, you see uprightness, you see holiness, you see the attributes, you see love. Just copy my life. Now, that could be dangerous. We are not to be followers of men. We're to be followers of the Lord. Paul knew that. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, same book, 11, verse 1, he says, Be imitators of me <coughs> as I am of Christ. You know? How many young Christians may have been led down a wrong path by an, uh, a, a cult leader or an ungodly leader or something of that nature? Paul says to the Corinthians, he says, yeah, be imitators of me, 
but only to the extent that I am following what God's Word says and the way the Lord Jesus Christ lived, imitate me as I am of Christ. Ephesians 5.1, he says it again. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. We had those examples at the beginning, how children imitate their father. Years ago, years ago, we was at one of the, one of the first churches when I became a Baptist. I kind of shared my testimony. I got saved when I was in a Reformed church. I began to study the scriptures, and, and I came to, uh, you know, what is this baby baptism? They don't believe, and I couldn't find any answers with covenant theology and things of that nature. And and my wife and I, we, we joined uh, Standale. We were baptized, and we joined Standale Baptist Church. In Standale Baptist Church, there was a guy by the name of J. Moderman. They called him Dell. That was his middle name, J. Dell Moderman. And J. Dell Moderman was about six foot three, big, tall guy, blonde hair, and he because he, and he was very skinny. And when he walked, he had I can't even imitate it because I'm short and fat, but he had a long stride, you know, and. They would come in about five minutes before the service would start. His wife was fairly tall, too, and they had two little kids. At that time, they were like four and three, and they looked exactly like their dad. Both of them. They looked like each other, and they both looked like their dad. And when they came into church, the dad would come in first, and Jay Moderman had that long stride, and he'd come walking down the church aisle, you know. He had just a unique stride because he was so tall. And it was always comical because the two boys right behind him looked exactly like their dad. Of course, they're little short guys, but they're trying to imitate dad's stride, you know. And they're coming down the church aisle, stretching their feet out. like that. And, and everyone, as they walk by, everyone's kind of go, oh. <laughs> but every Sunday, it was the same thing. The, the Modernman's, Jay's family is coming in, and these two young boys were trying to look just like their dad. Paul says, be imitators of God as just that. Paul knew that kids copy their parents, you know, but they pick up the things that we say, like, get out of my way, you idiot, you know, and, and uh, they pick those things up. They, they copy their parents. Paul says there, be an imitator of me. Can, you can imagine these Thessalonians. They didn't know what the Christian life was like. They had been in idolatry. They had, they had been in paganism. And now they got saved. And now they say, what do we do? Well, they became imitators of Paul. I say this here. They imitated Paul's lifestyle. Coming out of paganism, they did not know what a real Christian life looked like. How were they to live now that they were saved? They, you know, they, they didn't know. It was all new to them. But Paul's life among them showed them how to live. They hadn't seen Jesus walk on the earth. Remember, at this time, the Gospels were not printed yet. They did have the Old Testament. They had some converted Jews who could explain some things out of the Old Testament. But they copied Paul's life. Like a child copying his father, they copied the life of Paul. Paul says that. You became imitators of me. Now, I say this. If his example had not been a godly lifestyle they would have thought that that was normal Christianity. Kids growing up in a church want to know what Christianity is all about. They look to the people of their local church to know what Christianity is all about. And if they see hypocrites and they see people who, who cheat on their taxes, they see people who who tell dirty jokes, they see people who gossip out in the church in narthex, they're going to think, well, this is what normal Christianity is like. And they're going to copy that. Uh, Dr. James Dobson, he's gotten older now, but of course he used to be very, very well known. He had focus on the family. 
uh, on the radio stations, and he wrote many books. But in one of his books, he had this illustration. A father was heading down the expressway much faster than the speed limit with his son in the back seat. All of a sudden, his radar detector went off on his dashboard, and he slowed down. As they came around the curve, there was a police car. But the father was now going the speed limit. Okay? After they got by, the father resumed his former <coughs> illegal speed again. Now listen to this. The son in the back seat spoke up and said, We sure fooled him, didn't we, Dad? Kind of comical, but that son learned a lesson that day, didn't he? He's going to copy his dad's lifestyle and thinking that you can get away with things. Imitators. Young Christians can look to older Christians to see, to understand what the Christian life is like. Boy, that puts a real responsibility on us as the people they look to to see what the normal Christian life is like. Point number two, becoming an example. Now, it's kind of interesting, in just a couple of verses, Paul flips the whole situation around. He says this, remember, in those first verses, he said, you became imitators of me. And now he says, verses 7 and 8, he says, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. These were Roman provinces. I got a map just a little bit later, but you remember Paul was over in what they called Asia. It wasn't the Asia of China and Japan and stuff, but it's often called Asia Minor today. And then with the Macedonian call, Paul came over to, to Europe, came over to the Roman world, and these are the two provinces that Paul was traveling in, Thessalonica was one of the first churches that was established. People got saved and was established here over in Macedonia. And because of their godliness, because of that trade route, because of their lifestyle, they became an example for others. Paul goes to another church, another town, and he preaches, and they get saved. And the Macedonian church was an example for that new church. Wow, now the whole shoe is on the other foot. They're not the imitators, but they're the example that others are imitating. He says, For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. Paul didn't need to tell them how to live the Christian life because the Macedonian, or I'm sorry, the Thessalonian Christians were showing them what they, how they were to live the Christian life. Isn't that interesting? The Greek word here for, um, for, Example, we looked at the word to imitate. The Greek word here for example is tupos. It means a model or a representation. Have you ever heard about in the Old Testament that there are pictures of the realities of the spiritual world, pictures, and we call them types, right? You've heard about types from the Old Testament. That's where This is the word it comes from. They are models or representations or examples that you can look at. I remember reading a, 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 a whole paragraph that was describing an apple. And as you read it, okay, it was a shafir, it was a shafir, I can't even say the word, spherical object, and then it had a whole bunch of explanation about it. And you read that and you say, huh? And then you turn the page, and there's an apple sitting there. And you go, oh, yeah, yeah, I know what that's talking about now. All you need is an example to show you. Huh? Acts 7, here's a couple of cross-references. Acts 7, 44. This is an interesting way 
of the way the word is used and helps us understand the example. I know you're wondering what that little blue spot is there. Well, there's a word going to appear in there. The two boss is going to appear in there. Paul, uh, Luke writes here. Oh, actually, actually, Luke is telling us about Stephen's speech. Okay, this is Stephen, Stephen's speech. And Stephen is talking about Moses and the building of the wasn't the tabernacle then, it was called the tent of meeting because it was, a, it was a temporary tent that they would take down. The tabernacle wasn't built until Solomon's day. Um, but it says, uh, Stephen is preaching and he says, our fathers had the tent of witness, tent of meeting, in the wilderness, just as he spoke, as, as, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. Moses saw a vision of all of the tabernacle furniture up in heaven. Hebrews tells us about this. And then he told the artisans of Israel how to make all of the furniture, because Moses had actually seen it. Well, that up in heaven was an example, was a pattern for them to follow. That's our word there, tupos. Okay? So that's kind of how it is, it is used. You have an example there. How many times has an example clarified in your mind something that, well, I don't understand this. Well, let me give you an example. Oh, I see now. Examples clarify how we're to do something or how to understand something. The Thessalonian believers were an example to others around Macedonia and Achaia of how they were to live the Christian life. 1 Timothy 4.12 says, Let no one despise, Paul writing to Timothy, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Now, in the book of Acts, shortly before he came to Thessalonica, before the Macedonian call, Paul had picked up a young Timothy back in Lystra, Derby, in Lystra, in the book of Acts, okay, on his second missionary journey. Lois and Eunice and probably Timothy all got saved on the first missionary journey. Now, several years later, Paul comes back on the second missionary journey, and Paul and Timothy is, is growing and doing well, and so Paul takes him with him as a disciple, but also to train him to do work in the ministry. But 1 Timothy was written many years later. Most Bible scholars believe Timothy was probably, though when he first joined with Paul, maybe he was 17, 18 years old, at the time of this writing, he is probably in his 40s. He's not a young guy anymore. But yet, Paul says, let no one despise you for your youth. Well, that should be a real encouragement for some of you. You know, uh, you're still youth if you're in that age. But elders, remember one of the offices in the local church was the elder and that word literally meant elder, not only spiritually mature, but they often look to the older 60, 70 year old people to guide them as the elders of the local church. So bringing a 40 year old Timothy, Paul had left Timothy in Ephesus to straighten out some of the problems. So here's this young buck in his 40s, trying to straighten these older people out, you know. And Paul says, don't let them despise your youth. But Timothy, in your speech, in your conduct, in your love, in your faith, in your purity, be an example to everyone. So they'll see it in you and they'll say, oh, that's the way I'm supposed to love. That's the way I'm supposed to talk. That's the way I'm supposed to be pure. That's the way I'm supposed to have faith. Timothy was an example to these people at Ephesus, or Paul tells him to be an example here. Okay, 
So they went from being imitators to being examples. Uh, now the shoe's on the other foot, I say. First, they used Paul's lifestyle to imitate. Through him, they saw what real Christianity was like to live out in your everyday life. They saw Paul's life, and they began to imitate that. And then, because they were imitating Paul's life, but now, Paul says, others were looking to their lifestyle to know what real Christianity was like. You want to know something? Everybody here, you're either an imitator of others, and I say, I wasn't going to say or, I should say and, and your life is an example to others. You can be both at the same time. The Thessalonians were imitators of Paul, but they were examples to the other believers in Macedonia. That's the way it is. You need to look to godly leaders for an example of what Christianity is all about, but there are others who are looking to you to know how to live the Christian life. What are they seeing? Boy, that's an awesome responsibility that we have. I said here, believers all over the Roman provinces of Macedonia and Achaia knew what the Thessalonian believers lived like, and these other churches followed their example. Here, I, bought, I got a map. I got to find my, there it is. Asia, where'd I go? There am I. Asia was right over here. The whole first missionary journey of Paul, I know the map isn't, isn't big enough, but the whole first missionary journey of Paul was over here in the province of Asia. Paul went out on his second missionary journey. Come on, I lost it. No, I didn't. It's just not pointing where I want it to point. And somewhere up around here, he went through Lystra. He picked up Timothy. And then Paul had the vision of the Macedonian call. Okay? So he got on a boat and he left from Troas. And the first town he went to was Philippi. He preached there. Lydia was a Jewish lady who went down to the river to pray with a group, and Paul went with them and, and preached the gospel. They got saved. They cast a demon out of a young gal, and the people got in an uproar, and Paul got thrown in jail. And you remember the story of the Philippian jailer. All of the, the, the doors flew open, and the, and the jailer knew that he was going to be killed. If, uh, if anyone got out of the Philippian jail, he would have been responsible, and he would have had to take their penalty for him. And he comes running into the cell, and he says, Paul, what must I do to be saved? And Paul preached the gospel to him, and he got saved. And, and after they left Philippi, the next major town they came down to was, oh, there it is, was Thessalonica. And Paul preached there. <laughs> More trouble broke out. They sent Paul off, and he went to Berea. After Berea, he went down to Athens. And then from Athens, he went over to Corinth, and this is where he's writing the letter to the Thessalonians from. But you notice this. This was a Roman province called Asia. But in these verses, Paul talks about the two Roman provinces of Macedonia up in this area, and then the Roman province of Achaia down in this area. Thessalonica was here, but their reputation and their lifestyle, lifestyle was noted by those down in Corinth. They were sending offerings to help Paul out, their generosity and their giving and their lifestyle. They became examples for others. I guess I think about that. You know, here I'm a pastor and and people think, well, what is Christianity all about? Well, let's look to Pastor Herrick. Let's see what that's going to be like. Um, is real Christianity impatient? Does real Christianity yell at other drivers on the expressway? <laughs> does, does, does re you know, we need to consider how our lives are examples for others. That is frightening to think about. All right, point number three. I'm doing well here on time. What did they exemplify? Well, Paul begins to talk about what they exemplified. Paul says here, For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. 
and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. So they were examples. And this is Paul is saying here, this is how you were examples. I've tried to break it down. I got a list here. What qualities did the Thessalonians show to other believers? Number one, uh, they showed them hospitality. Paul says the kind of reception we had among you. You remember when Paul, when when the Thessalonians hired, when the when the jealous Jews hired that people to start a mo these mobsters to start a riot. They went to Jason's house and Paul wasn't there. Now, why do you think Paul wasn't there? Here's why. Paul was not a coward. But I think the Thessalonian believers were protecting him. And Jason and others were arrested and fined instead of Paul and Silas. And then the believers, to protect Paul, sent him away. They showed him great love and kindness and hospitality. Paul says, the kind of reception we had among you. They showed him holiness. They turned from idols. They were pagans. They were worshiping idols. I, I got a couple more here, but I'm going to jump to my next slide because on my next slide, I got some of the things that were always associated with idol worship. Here's some of the things that were associated. Practices involved with pagan idol worship. They turned from this when they heard the gospel. Before that, they were involved in some of this. Number one, t t well, first of all, idol worship in and of itself, taking worship that belongs to God and giving to it to a man-made false god. That's what idol worship is. Do you remember the very first commandment of the Ten Commandments? Well, let's see. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet. What was the first commandment? Worship any other god. Yeah, very first of the Ten Commandments. So that in and of itself is a is a horrific practice to be an idol worshiper. But associated with that, um, I said here because it was man-made idols, actually idol worship uh, involves self-worship. I made that idol. I formed him, you know, and I worship him as a god, but I made him. So in, re in reality, idol worship is kind of worshiping yourself, setting yourself up as god. What caused Satan, Lucifer, to fall as the archangel in heaven. He said, I will ascend to the heights. I will take God's place. I will put myself there. Idol worshiper often involved in the Old Testament, we find in many places it involved infant sacrifice. They would take a child, a baby, and sacrifice him to this idol, throw him in the fire. Temple prostitutes were common with much of the Greek and Roman idol worshipers. Um, I'm going to go down, honey, I'm going to go down to the temple and worship. Yeah, the wife knew what that meant. You know, the husband was going to go down and, and hire a prostitute and worship God by hiring a prostitute down there. Prost uh, temple prostitutes were very common. Sorcery and witchcraft is often associated with idol worship. And then I say here, um, many times, the rich, uh, they would buy favors from the gods. I have that in quotes because that's found in some of the ancient literature about the worship in the Roman Empire. They would buy favors from the gods for high prices. It was commonplace. The rich could afford it, and the poor couldn't get those favors from God. So idol worship. The Thessalonians were involved in some of this stuff, and they turned from idols to worship the true God. Service, the, to serve the living and true God. They got busy serving the Lord. Evangelism. They were on a major trade route. I can just see the church. Thessalonians, let's have a, let's have a meeting. Okay, let's get organized on how we can reach Thessalonica with the gospel. But let's get organized because we have travelers going through Thessalonica all the time. Let's get organized. How can we reach them with the gospel? Then they're going to take the gospel to all other places. They were serving the living and true God. And then I say here, um, they were expecting Christ's return. I think as believers, we should be living 
with the fact that Jesus Christ could come back any time. Theologically, we have the doctrine of the eminent return of Jesus Christ. That means Jesus Christ, the rapture, could take place any time in this church age. We don't know when it will be. Fulfilled prophecy does not have to be... Uh, what do I, how do I want to say that? There is no prophecy that needs to be fulfilled in the church age before Jesus Christ comes. Jesus Christ could come back before the end of our service. I'll get done preaching. He'll hold off until then. And then I'll go to close in prayer and you'll all bow your heads and all of a sudden Pastor Herrick quits preaching in the middle of his prayer or quits, quits praying in the middle of his prayer and you guys look up and Pastor Herrick is gone. No, oh, no, you know what that would mean? That means you've been left behind. No, oh, that ain't the way it's going to be. You're going to come with us if you, with me if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. They were waiting for that son. Now, that word waiting doesn't mean, okay, I'm going to stand here and do nothing until Jesus Christ. In fact, that was a problem in some of the churches that they were quitting their job and they were just waiting for Jesus to come back. That isn't what the New Testament means by that word waiting. It means, it goes along with the previous one, it means serving the Lord, um, expecting that Jesus could come back at any time. And that's a real theme in this book of Thessalonians. So these are some of the qualities that they were exemplifying. And there are probably other ones. Giving. That Paul will talk in this book about how they sent offerings to him. They set an example for the other churches. Their lifestyles. All right, let me go on. I had already talked about these things that could be involved in pagan idol worship. Conclusion. If you are a relatively young Christian, I say here, latch on to an older, mature, godly, <clears throat> godly Christian and watch their life. You will learn how to live a spiritual life, a godly Christian life, by watching their example. Okay. I also say here, oh, I say imitate them to the extent that they imitate Jesus, you know, all of us as humans have faults and failures, and those watching us can see that and say, well, you know, maybe he, he isn't perfect. He has shown me a lot of godliness, but I'm going to follow Jesus in this matter rather than following him, you know. But I also say here, if you are a mature Christian, remember, there are others watching you. Give them a godly example to follow. We need to do that. Every day of our lives, people, the unsaved are looking at our lives so that they can bring accusation against us. Young Christians are looking at our lives so that they know what Christianity is all about. Show them what the Christian life is supposed to be like. All right, let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this book of the Thessalonians. Father, they were imitators, and yet, Father, they became examples for others. Father, that certainly is true with us as well. I pray that we would live godly lives, showing others what Christianity, what real Christianity is supposed to be like. Thank you, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand?